So Brennan's ready. So let's get Brennan up here. And uh, let me do a proper introduction here. I have to take a look. It's a very, very long title. But Brennan Price, N4QX from the ARRL, WRC 12, Agenda Item 1.19, Shaping the International Regulatory Framework for Software-Defined and Cognitive Radio Systems. Brennan Price. Thanks so much, Steve. I appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Steve said, I'm uh, Brennan Price in 4QX. Steve uh, indicated that there might be some other lawyers in the audience. Are there any? Maybe not. <laughs> might be the only one here. Oh, pardon me. We don't raise what? our hands very high. Oh, okay. That's fine. Is, would you get offended by a lawyer joke that I usually uh, start these? I have uh, a lawyer joke. Pardon? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, this is, um, I, I actually told this one uh, at uh, Dayton Hamvention a couple of years ago at the Ham Radio and the Law Forum, and uh, I, I think it uh, uh, will be appreciated by this audience. Um, there was an engineer who uh, died, unfortunately, uh, went up to St. Peter. St. Peter didn't have his reading glasses on that day, misread the line, sent him down. So the engineer is... Uh, down in hell, and uh, he's looking around and goes, this really kind of stinks. It's hot, uh, people are doing all kinds of work uh, for uh, no good reason. There could be, this place could be improved. So immediately, the engineer goes to work. In about a day, he installs air conditioning all throughout hell, and uh, people are cool and in a much better mood. And he watches Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the hill, gets to the top of the hill and, uh, and rolls back down, and he thinks, there's got to be a better way to do that. So he starts building an escalator system up this hill. And uh, Sisyphus, uh, once he's done, uh, takes the boulder, rides up the hill, still falls down the hill when he gets, uh, when he gets done, but at least he's able to ra relax a little bit uh, going up the hill. All kinds of other improvements. They, uh, the engineer institutes wireless communications, uh, modern methods of sanitation, and all of a sudden, it's not such a bad place to be. It even gets the, not or get the notice of Lucifer himself, who's going, hmm, this is pretty good. I'm glad this guy came down here. So Lucifer and God have this conference call about once every couple of weeks to coordinate on matters of administrating the afterlife. And uh, so God uh, says something along the lines of, oh, how are things going to hell these days? And Lucifer goes, well, actually pretty good. We got this engineer a couple of uh, weeks ago, and he's installed air conditioning and escalators, and we have wireless communications, modern methods of sanitation, all kinds of other things. Everybody's here, ha here is happy. Uh, we're having a great time. It's actually pretty good. And God said, yeah, I... I meant to talk to you about that. Uh, St. Peter, you know how he is, made a mistake. Uh, that guy belongs to us. You need to send him up here. And Lucifer is like, oh, no, I don't think we're going to do anything like that. You know, we're happy with his services here. We're going to keep him. So they start arguing for a little while. And finally, God gets mad and says, OK, come on. If you don't send him up here, I'm going to sue. Lucifer just goes, ha, ha, that's funny. Where are you going to find a lawyer? <laughs> so. Um, at any rate, uh, I, I tell that joke because uh, I, I bring a different uh, set of skills uh, than my predecessor in this position. Paul Rodaldo, the league's chief technology officer, is uh, transitioning into retirement. Uh, I've been in the position of the technical relations manager for about a uh, for about a year now. Uh, even though I'm a lawyer and not an engineer, uh, I was a patent lawyer by uh, practice, so I don't shake when I uh, attend conferences like these or uh, hear the language of the trade. Uh, but I'm going to speak with you about a topic today that m many, if not most of you in this room, probably know a little bit more than I do about. And that's uh, about software-defined radio and cognitive radio systems. Um, if you're looking for an engineering-heavy discussion, you're probably not going to find it here. Uh, I won't be offended if you decide you want to go to the introductory session, which will probably be a little bit more techy than this is. But uh, I, I've tried to uh, explain uh, in, this in this talk what's going on, why we care, and uh, what some of our issues are. So this is ITU headquarters in Geneva. Uh, the tall building is uh, called the Tower, strangely, or 
uniquely enough. This is the Montbriant building. Uh, I don't know if you can see on top of this building, but uh, the uh, radio station for you on ITU is about right here, and there are antennas uh, uh, on top there. A little bit beyond the Montbriant building is what they call the CICG. Uh, that is the um, uh, conference center where the World Radio Conference takes place uh, whenever it's in Geneva, and it's almost always in Geneva. It will be in Geneva in 2007. It will be in Geneva again in early 2012, where uh, it was just moved for a variety of reasons, which I might talk about later. It's nice to have hands in high places. You're looking at the Secretary General of the ITU, Hamadoun Touré, uh, from Mali. Uh, he has a Swiss amateur radio license, HB, HB9EHT. Uh, and uh, he has, uh, we have people on staff uh, who are also amateurs who are helping him get a station set up at home. Uh, so it's, uh, he, he is a friend of the amateur service and uh, we're, uh, that's a good thing. The ITU is an intergovernmental organization. It's kind of like the UN. You wonder what goes on at these meetings. Well, did you see any coverage of the recent UN General Assembly or Security Council meetings where people were sitting behind uh, signs with country names and talking about nuclear disarmament and global peace and uh, the problems of the Middle East? If you take that uh, picture and substitute radio talk for uh, global disarmament and so forth. You essentially get what go, what's goes on at these meetings. Uh, it's an intergovernmental organization. Uh, the public and private sectors cooperate uh, to develop uh, various telecommunications standards. The ITU adopts international regulations and treaties governing terrestrial and space uses of the frequency spectrum in satellite orbits. Why should we care? Because we have our own regulator here in the uh, United States, the FCC, and we care basically because these regulations uh, can uh, have a certain amount of inertia. Uh, they're hard to form, they're hard, they're, they're hard to write, they're hard to delete, uh, and by default they are the rules in many countries throughout the world. We'll talk about this a little bit later in another slide, but uh, even if our regulator uh, has a positive view toward techn technological development in the amateur radio service, some things that happened at the ITU can throw a monkey uh, wrench in the works uh, if we're not careful. ITU also developed standards to ensure interconnection. Um, one of our speakers yesterday, and I'm, I'm sorry I forgot the name, it was the PS2 keyboard uh, or speaker. Are you in here? I'm sorry. I, I apologize. But uh, it mentioned one of the uh, ITU... Uh, uh, standards, uh, recommendation uh, M.1677, which is International Morse Code. The amateur working group at uh, ITU is actually responsible for the maintenance of that standard, and it is maintained. We added a new character a couple of years ago, the uh, at sign, and uh, re cleaned it up recently, as, uh, as recently as last May. The radio communication sector is one of three sectors of ITU. It is the radio communication sector which concentrates on um, the development of radio regulations. Uh, there are a variety of meetings uh, that work, uh, or a variety of groups that meet periodically in order to work their way up to world radio communication conferences, which are where the regulations are actually changed and new topics for discussion of the future are considered. Uh, the radio communication advisory group is, uh, advises the staff of the BR, the Radio Communication Bureau, it's called BR because it's French, or they speak French in Geneva. There are six study groups, two of which we uh, actively uh, monitor, uh, as well as the Radio Regulations Board, which is responsible for editorial changes uh, and maintenance of the radio regulations. Once again, it pays to have hams in high places. Shayla Taylor, KA5PRZ, uh, is the chair of that group. Uh, and uh, she has been on the air. Uh, John Cyberling, my colleague in the uh, technical relations office, has uh, seen to that uh, when they were both at uh, uh, 4U1ITU. There are six study groups. John Cyberling uh, is generally responsible for uh, the material that is discussed in study group one, including what we're going to be talking about today, the uh, software-defined radio and cognitive radio systems uh, issue. Uh, study group five is the home of various terrestrial services, uh, including the amateur service. I'm generally responsible for that beat. 
There are three working parties within uh, Working Party One. Uh, John covers uh, essentially all of them. Uh, the software-defined radio question is being fleshed out right now in Working Party 1B. Um, uh, Working Party 1A is also uh, particularly important because uh, there are ongoing debates about power line telecommunications going on in that uh, Working Party. Uh, we know that here in the United States as BPL. Uh, things aren't going well uh, for the BPL people on that stage either. Uh, they win some victories from here, here and there, but when you get right down to it, there aren't a lot of people using the technology. I think uh, the last FCC report had under 5,000 subscribers nationwide. Um, it uh, uh, hasn't really taken off. Working Party 5 uh, deals with uh, the terrestrial service, services. Working Party 5A is our home uh, uh, for the amateur and amateur satellite services. Uh, most space services are actually over in study group four, uh, but uh, we uh, have, advocate, have lobbied successfully so far uh, to keep uh, amateur and amateur satellite uh, issues uh, together. Uh, we can see similarly situated uh, services, uh, maritime mobile, aeronautical mobile, radio location, uh, and uh, fixed wireless and uh, fixed HF uh, are also members of this working party. Um, some of the technologies are very similar, uh, and um, discussions among the service, uh, services are helpful uh, for uh, arriving at standards. There are a number of standards uh, and recommendations uh, for which the amateur working groups are uh, responsible. Uh, we've listed them here. Uh, material about software-defined radio has been incorporated in some of these recommendations uh, just in order to uh, document for administrations around the world that uh, this technology does exist, uh, is in use, and isn't as scary as, uh, as some people uh, would uh, lead you to believe. Uh, we also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, are, res are responsible for maintaining the, uh, uh, the International Morse Code and its uh, technical characteristics. There are a whole lot of meetings the ITU has. Probably the two that, are, uh, most, uh, that you're most familiar with and uh, that are our big motivators for doing what we do are the Radio Communication Assembly, which is held one week before each World Radio Communication Conference, uh, which usually lasts uh, four weeks uh, long. Uh, the next RA will be in middle of January 2012. The next WRC will be immediately thereafter, spanning from January to February. Uh, it was originally scheduled for uh, October 2011. Uh, however, um, it, it conflicted uh, with... Um, with Ramadan, uh, there were a significant number of ITU member states who uh, expressed objections and reservations uh, uh, regarding that. They were unable to relocate it within 2011, which it normally should, uh, where the normally the WRC should appear because they normally happen every three to four years. We're actually at around four and a half years meeting uh, in the beginning of 2012, but uh, that's the next thing that's going to happen. The, um, there are certain rules governing what happens at a WRC. Essentially, the WRC is tasked with revising the radio regulations, uh, which is uh, the primary thing that we uh, keep uh, an eye on. It can deal with any question of worldwide character within its agenda, um, and people uh, or the ITU has a tendency to... Uh, have an expansive definition of what constitutes an issue of worldwide character. Uh, and decisions have to be in accordance with other documents of the ITU. There are generally two uh, WRCs between plenipots, which are essentially conferences governing the ITU as a whole. The second one may or may not be council. Um, as a general rule, um, there are rules about uh, who, where and when the uh, uh, WRC uh, may happen, and as a general rule, decisions at a conference are reached by consensus. You have people from all over the world locked in a room for four weeks debating and haggling over issues, and uh, eventually uh, people cave and something comes out. There are a number of uh, items on the agenda for the next conference uh, in, uh, 2000, um, in 2012. 
uh, sometimes amateur radio is fortunate enough to be able to play offense. Uh, we are in that boat here. Uh, one of the agenda items is considering an allocation uh, close to 500 kilohertz on a secondary basis. Um, what you see here is the text of an agenda item. There are 25 of these which are on the table uh, for the next conference. Um, there are, uh, for those of you who might be interested in this particular frequency, there uh, are experimental uh, operations ongoing uh, right now, um, headed up by Fritz Robb. Um, who's uh, volunteering uh, to uh, head those up for us. Uh, there is some resistance in the maritime community to uh, giving up that spectrum. Uh, we're working on it. We'll see how it uh, comes out uh, in 2012. Usually, we're playing defense, and playing defense is something that we're, that we're also doing at this conference. Um, I'm just going through this really quickly. This is not the uh, beat of my talk, but um, there are two things that we're keeping a particularly close eye on, items uh, 1.14 to 1.15. 1.14 um, uh, seeks to put radio location on a worldwide basis somewhere in VHF. That's range from 30 to 300 megahertz as broad as a... Uh, as the side of a barn, and uh, we're, of course, uh, of course, don't want that to land on 50 to 40, 54, or 144 to 148, or uh, 222 through 225. Uh, so far, it looks like that that uh, item is going well. Um, the, the preferred band for the proponents, uh, Russia in this case, is actually uh, 154 to 156. Land mobile interests here in the United States aren't particularly happy about that, but uh, there's also a uh, HF oceanographic radar uh, item on the agenda. Uh, that's actually being... Uh, 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 advocated by uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, and uh, we're fortunate that here that the major proponent uh, knows us well, likes us, and doesn't want to pick a fight with the amateur service. So they're looking at spectrum other than what we have on HF. So when we play defense, we're uh, not only playing defense in matters of spectrum allocation, and those tend to be the uh, more high-profile sexier, if you will, to the extent that any of this is sexy, uh, uh, issues that happen at uh, a world radio conference. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, you'll uh, remember that uh, the uh, regulations defining the amateur service were under review. Uh, it was only within the past few years that uh, uh, Morse, international Morse code as a uh, requirement for um, operator proficiency uh, at HF uh, was removed. Um, and periodically, purely regulatory issues as opposed to uh, uh, spectrum allocation issues come up. That is the case with agenda item 1.19, uh, which considers or seeks to consider regulatory measures and their relevance in order to enable the introduction of software-defined radio and cognitive radio systems based on the results of studies, which are ongoing, in accordance with Resolution 956. And we'll try to dissect Resolution 956 uh, a little bit later. Now, you might be wondering, okay, and, and I, I watched Paul Rinaldo's talk last year. This question came up. Uh, what's in it for us? Uh, you know, we uh, have a fairly favorable regulatory environment here in the United States with respect to amateur radio. The commission encourages us to experiment. They've gone on record saying that uh, software-defined radio uh, is something that is absolutely fine uh, for uh, us to uh, build and use here in the United States. Well, not all regulators are as cool as our FCC. Dick might be leaping out of his chair uh, over there when I congratulated the FCC, but it, it is true. Uh, the prospect of frequency agile equipment or software changeable equipment uh, it is difficult for a number of administrations to understand. It is not readily accepted by more administrations throughout the world than you would think. Um, every year, uh, we teach a class in Newington uh, for uh, foreign regulators uh, or people involved in uh, 
uh, various uh, radio communication services uh, throughout the world. Uh, it is aimed at uh, administrators from developing countries. Um, and uh, I, I was taken aback last year, shortly after I started this job, uh, when uh, one of the participants asked, so wait a minute, you have a knob on your radios and you can change the frequency? That is a foreign concept to a lot of regulators. Um, and in many of these countries, amateur radio is barely tolerated. It's not a very big uh, presence. Uh, so people, uh, so the regulators are, don't really uh, understand that. But a lot of services uh, for safety of life reasons or for operability reasons, the broadcast service, the maritime mobile service, uh, are quite heavily and restrictively regulated. Uh, with respect to international regulations, we have a regulator here in the United States uh, who is willing to deviate from the recommendations of uh, the uh, radio regulations in certain instances. Uh, we're the beneficiary of that. For instance, uh, at close to 5.4 megahertz, uh, we have five discrete channels uh, upon which uh, we can operate. That's not in the international radio regulations. It's something we do here and in a few other countries around the world. But they're generally the rule rather than the exception. In many developing countries, the radio regulations are the regulations. Uh, so uh, when it comes to uh, moving operators and equipment across international borders, these regulations have consequences. Um, I have re received a number of calls in my first tenure at ARL. Uh, I was a uh, regulatory specialist uh, in the old field of educational services department. I'd get a call maybe about once every eight months from a ham who crossed into Canada at a remote border crossing, got a newbie crossing guard, didn't know anything about amateur radio, and held him up for about an hour and a half. It happens. And this is Canada, which is a very, uh, or a, a, has a fairly developed uh, um, regulatory structure and generally knows what amateur radio is. But, you know, if, if, can, if this happens in Canada, you know it's going to happen when moving from one developing country to another developing country uh, for uh, recreational or for uh, public service and disaster relief purposes. So this is why we should care. The radio regulations form a baseline, and they are respected by a number of countries. And even if we're OK here, it might not be so easy to play with software defined or new systems uh, in other countries around the world. Uh, an example of this, uh, you'll remember in around uh, 2000, maybe a little bit later, uh, well, yeah, it was 2000 when it was implemented. There was a license restructuring uh, where we went from uh, six uh, classes of license to um, three. Uh, there was a debate at that time whether to continue Morse code as a uh, requirement domestically. Uh, and uh, even here in the United States, uh, where departures from the radio regulations are probably a little bit more usual than they are elsewhere in the world, uh, that didn't happen. And if you look at the report in order, the sole reason why that didn't happen at least according to the person who wrote the report in order, is there's an international regulation. We feel compelled to uh, uh, follow it. Uh, and once that regulation went away, it took a little while for the uh, process to uh, come through, but the Morse requirement went away as well. So uh, they are paid heed to. Before I uh, started this job, I was a patent lawyer. Anybody have it here a named inventor on any patents? Quite a few people. Um, I was usually a litigator. I did a little bit of patent drafting, but usually I uh, uh, litigated patents. The fewer words, the better it is uh, for the inventor in a patent and for, I think, the radio amateur when we're talking about uh, regulation. Um, if we're talking about a patent on a stool, and the patent claim reads, a stool comprising a sitting surface and three legs. Doesn't have a lot of words. You can add a number of things to that, including a back, a fourth leg, a certain number of decorations, and you still have a stool with a sitting surface and three legs. And that's good for the inventor because 
said patent is infringed. Don't know if that would be valid anymore. I'm quite sure it wouldn't be, but that's, uh, that's fewer words is good. On the other hand, I always loved when I was defending a patent infringement claim to see a, a claim in a patent that was about six paragraphs long, even though a claim has to be a single sentence and managed to get subdivided to around six parts where you have a stool with a surface with a concave indenture uh, such that the first surface of the concave indenture is at this angle to the second surface of the concave indenture, and then it goes on and it has restrictions with respect to the legs. The more words you have, the harder it is to infringe a particular patent claim. And the more words that are in a regulation, whether internationally or nationally, as a general rule, the more restrictive that is to research and innovation. And we're really trying, uh, not only here in the United States, but around the world, to allow people who want to play with radio and make new stuff uh, to be able to do that and transport it. So we, we're hoping for, as we approach agenda item 1.19, to not get into a lot of verbiage and not adopt something that is terribly restrictive. So we get to resolution 956. This is actually printed in the proceedings uh, in the uh, annex. Um, but there are 10 considerings um, uh, that uh, the last World Radio Conference asked the next conference to uh, consider. And uh, you can... Uh, see that uh, it, within these considerings, uh, some points that might be of apprehension to some countries that, who don't quite understand the, uh, or, or don't quite, aren't quite comfortable with the prospect of a radio that can be defined by software, or even more radically, a uh, radio that can pick its own frequency based on, uh, um, uh, based on its environment, how it determines its environment. I would say right now that the debate on this issue is uh, progressing in such a way that uh, software-defined radio is not terribly controversial uh, because it's a little bit more easily understood. It's a radio with uh, a, a software component uh, as opposed to a traditional radio where uh, all the components are, uh, are hardware. Cognitive radio systems scare people a little bit more. They scare me a little bit because you're looking at the uh, possibility of, uh, of throwing the radio regulations out the window, both domestically and internationally, and just picking a clear uh, frequency. It could be a frequency uh, within the amateur service uh, used by somebody else, theoretically. Um, you know, the, the whole idea is a frequency is chosen based on what, it, what the system determines is not in use and will work for a particular path at a particular time. And, you know, if that can be made to successfully work, uh, why do you need regulations? You, you just uh, pick, uh, pick a frequency that works at a particular time. You know, it could very well be that uh, my peers and other organizations and I are, don't have anything to do with the ITU anymore. So, uh, you know, that's not a good reason to, uh, <laughs> to, defeat, to uh, resist cognitive radio, but it's, it certainly is thinking outside of the box. Um, one of the uh, things that is uh, a little bit interesting to me is considering Jay. Uh, which actually talks about uh, having a worldwide har harmonized uh, pilot channel uh, with a bandwidth of around 50 kilohertz or less uh, where cognitive radio systems can essentially communicate with each other and uh, try to uh, establish a, uh, a frequency so, or, or uh, on which to communicate. So uh, there are a little bit of allocation issues here. But what we're uh, mostly focused on is uh, to try to preserve freedom of experimentation. Uh, there are some administrations, uh, notably Finland right now, uh, who are quite actively proposing that software-defined and cognitive systems be limited to a specific band um, to be named 
at the uh, next conference. The United States is resisting that position, saying, listen, this, these, this technology can be used in any radio service. It is used in a number of radio services. Uh, we go to these meetings and speak on behalf of the amateur service, saying, look, uh, it, it's inappropriate to confine these to a particular band, because it, it's not a, it is a technology. It is not a separate service. But uh, such is the resistance or apprehension about new technology among some administrations that they really just want to stick it in one particular ba band so it doesn't muck up the rest of the system. Uh, it's uh, a little hard to understand, but that's uh, one of the things we're uh, fighting against. So what is the next uh, WRC to do? Uh, or what is to be done before the next WRC? Well studying whether there's a need for regulatory measures uh, related to uh, um, software-defined radio and uh, also cognitive radio systems. And there's an invitation for the next World Radio Conference. They call it WRC 11 because it was WRC 11 until a few years, until a few months ago, uh, to consider the results and uh, make any recommendations. So these studies, which are mentioned, are ongoing. And uh, they're on being uh, headed up by uh, study group one, which just met in Geneva uh, the past two weeks. Uh, John Cyberling was at that meeting. Uh, he's now en route back to the United States and is going to turn around and go to a CTEL meeting in Argentina. Uh, <laughs> busy schedule for him, uh, busy schedule for me. I'm in Geneva next week, too. Um, study group, the discussions are going slowly because these meetings operate by consensus and essentially you have a few administrations advocating for very restrictive terms to apply to software-defined radio and cognitive systems uh, with no allowance for uh, amateur use or use within any particular service, not just the amateur service, versus a more flexible regulatory uh, approach of uh, the United States is advocating that, and uh, which will allow us to continue to do the things that we do. What has come out of the meeting in Geneva are a couple of definitions. Um, it took a number of years just to get all the countries in the world to agree on what exactly software-defined radio is and exactly on what a cognitive radio system is. Uh, those definitions are uh, on this slide. They seem uh, relatively... Uh, innocuous to me, uh, not a lot of words. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there's an exception to Brennan Price's rule about uh, patent claims and radio regulations, uh, where if you have a list, but if you, uh, generally if you have a list, it's restrictive, but if you put in words like including but not limited to, I like that. Um, so a software-defined radio uh, is defined as something where, uh, the transmitter uh, or receiver employs a technology that allows the operating parameters, including frequency range, modulated type, or uh, output power, to be set or altered by software, enabling changes to the operating parameters uh, which occur during the normal uh, pre-installed, uh, predetermined opera uh, operation of a radio according to a system specification or standard. It's a flexible definition. I think it'll work. I don't think there's any harm here. With respect to cognitive systems, talking about a radio system employing technology that allows the system to obtain knowledge of its uh, operational geographical environment, established uh, policies and its uh, initial state to dynamically and automatically adjust its operational parameters and protocols according to uh, its obtained knowledge in order to achieve predefined uh, objectives and also uh, learn from the uh, results obtained. Um, I think that's probably the best definition that we could get from this technology, which is kind of scary. Uh, whether there are any rules uh, governing the use of uh, uh, these systems that uh, come out, uh, uh, that comes out of the next World Radio Conference remains to be seen. Uh, but uh, here in the United States, uh, with the support of, uh, of amateurs and other uh, interested groups uh, in the United States. We're advocating for simply the adoption of definitions and nothing more, uh, no other changes to the radio regulations, essentially to permit us uh, a number or permit uh, free experimentation uh, within our service and within other services. That's all. Uh, 
and thank you. You're, under your definition of a software-defined radio, it would appear that my standard transceiver with a computer link could, be, could fit under the definition of a software-defined radio. Is that correct? Uh, I, I wouldn't disagree, uh, given a broad reading of that definition, uh, I, um, I, and which is why uh, we're really resisting uh, the uh, adoption of anything further uh, that would uh, prohibit that would prohibit the use of that radio or inhibit the radio, use of that radio anywhere in the world. Um, our point all along is that software-defined radios really operate essentially the same as traditional hardware-defined radios, uh, whether you've got a computer attached to it or not. And uh, it's, um, uh, we're uh, trying to hammer that point home. And we think we're, we're gaining ground. There are a couple of holdout administrations, most notably Finland, uh, but uh, we're working on that. I, I guess I wonder, the, with the whole process of software-defined radio, if they're going to generate special regulations for that, uh, how would you enforce this? Uh, I mean, it seems ridiculous to generate regulations for something that's unenforceable, and a software-defined radio operating in normal modes is indistinguishable from a regular hardware radio, isn't it? I, I concur, and that's, uh, that's an argument that is, uh, we're certainly making and uh, has been made by numerous uh, people, not within, just within the amateur service, but also within, uh, from representatives of other services uh, and other administrations uh, throughout the world. We're fortunate in the United States to be uh, essentially on the same slate uh, with, with, uh, with respect to this. Uh, you, you know, um, I talked about the 500 kilohertz a a allocation uh, a, a little bit earlier. There is some resistance, uh, most notably by the United States Coast Guard uh, here within the United States to, uh, uh, to a full 15 kilohertz. We're working uh, as diligently as we can to uh, overcome. But on, on this issue, uh, I, I think uh, other radio services, both uh, private and government, uh, feel the same way as you and I do that this is uh, something that is transparent uh, when you're actually on the air with respect to software-defined radio and that there's no real need to inhibit the use of uh, software-defined radio um, uh, by regulation. Uh, it's simply a matter of overcoming of resistance and apprehension by a number of other countries uh, to something that's new. The ITU operates very slowly. Uh, when in 2003 uh, the 7 megahertz amateur allocation was expanded in regions 1 and 3 from, uh, from 100 kilohertz wide to 200 kilohertz wide with implementation earlier this year, uh, that solved half of a problem that has existed since World War II. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, this is this process is going to move as slowly, but uh, you know, I, th I think it says something that we've been playing with software-defined radio for a number of years now, and uh, just now, uh, within the past week, uh, did study group one kind of agree on a definition and send it to the commission that translates it into six languages so it can be uh, considered for incorporation. Uh, so it, it is, there is some resistance, uh, and the resistance is part of the reason why it acts a little slowly. Uh, trunking radio systems, which we have in the United States here, would that be considered a cognitive uh, radio system? And if it is, it doesn't seem too scary. I realize CRS is a very broad description, but would that fall under that category? I, uh, I, I think the, uh, or, or the debate is uh, for cognitive radio systems is being... Uh, uh, looked, at, uh, looked at with a, a little bit more of a global uh, perspective. I mean, certainly trunking radio systems uh, do uh, choose frequencies based on, uh, uh, based on uh, frequency load uh, elsewhere uh, in the system. But uh, that's also, uh, th these systems, trunking systems are generally one system. I think that they're uh, looking at essentially other system or multiple systems trying to share uh, the same spectrum or choose a frequency uh, depending, on, um, uh, depending on certain conditions. Uh, I, I think read broadly, uh, trunking radio systems could be uh, considered cognitive radio here. Uh, but um, I, I don't think 
that particular scenario is at the top of the mind of the people who are, uh, who are debating this. Um, and I actually predict that there, there's enough apprehension about, cogn about true global cognitive systems uh, that, that I, I have a feeling that uh, there, it's a safe bet that, uh, well, not a safe bet, nothing's ever a safe bet, but I think it's going to be unlikely that uh, regulations with respect to cognitive systems uh, proceed uh, too terribly far at the next conference. And I think uh, we're eventually winning the uh, uh, war of persuasion on the software-defined radio front, too. But that's just speculation, and we've got to be vigilant. This is, I'm, I apologize, this might be too far off topic, and if so, you can answer it later, but uh, since you're the ARL target, um, I, I'm concerned about the, the guy recently who worked at a hospital and uh, went to work the amateur radio station at that hospital during a, an announced drill and got his uh, wrist slapped by the FCC. And that's not a technical issue, but uh, is the ARL uh, fighting that somehow, or are we going to be relegated to, uh, we can do all this great stuff with digital radio, but we, we can't even uh, support our local uh, public service, which is what we've been doing for the last 50 years. Um, I, uh, that is a good question. I, I'm going to uh, demur a, a little bit uh, and uh, uh, encourage uh, everyone, uh, if, if you have a, a, a question about that issue, to read a statement which was uh, actually authorized by the board uh, at its July meeting and uh, uh, was approved and released yesterday uh, regarding ARL's position there. With respect to that particular uh, situation, it's my understanding that the uh, uh, person who, or that the person in question uh, was uh, a hospital employee, and that uh, uh, that that puts uh, that raises an issue which I think is not present in all uh, disaster relief or uh, public preparedness uh, uh, situations, um, and it is a problem uh, which has a pretty significant and clear prohibition uh, in, in the rules. I have to be careful whatever I get on the air. Uh, ever since 2000, uh, my first tenure, and occasionally, again now, somebody will ask me, hey Brennan, when's the next repeater directory coming out? Or, hey Brennan, what's happening with the next handbook? Or, Brennan, what about this with the league? And I have to essentially say, why did I write you an email? Uh, because uh, the, the prohibition against communications on behalf of one's employer uh, is, uh, is is pretty uh, is pretty unambiguous. Uh, that being said, obviously uh, a, a vital uh, emergency communications uh, network with amateur contributions is, is something which uh, it's one of our reasons for existence and uh, something we're obviously very uh, concerned about. Uh, I think the paper uh, yesterday, based on my cursory reading of it, uh, does a good job of addressing that, and uh, I defer you to that. Brennan, on, on, if we go back to the slides, on the definition of cognitive radios, okay, it says a technology that allows the system to obtain knowledge of its operation and geographical environment and implied and established policies and internal state. Do all four of those have to be um, anded? to be declared a cognitive radio. For example, you have radios today that, that go out and listen for um, is, is that channel occupied and dynamically change. Well, that's kind of going out and, and saying, okay, there's my environment. So I'm curious, at, at what point is the radio just smart and when is it really truly cognitive? Right. Um, I, I think that uh, if we were to narrowly construe and, uh, that would be uh, it out for a lot of systems, probably including the trunking system, which was uh, brought up uh, earlier. Um, I'm trained as a patent lawyer. Uh, in a patent claim, the word and, by case law, means and or or. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I have to confess that I, I've not been around long enough to uh, know uh, how uh, people who interpret ITU regulations would uh, would rule on that issue, but uh, I, I'm a little bit, um, uh, you know, I, I reading it broadly, uh, I, I think that's a, a fairly uh, 
broad definition. Uh, I'd much prefer to read it narrowly, uh, because if we do read it narrowly, that's fewer systems that would get restricted by any potential regulations that are eventually adopted. Okay, well thank you very much, thank Brennan. You. Thank you everyone, and uh, those of you who are members of ARRL, we thank you for uh, your membership. We could not do what we do uh, in Newington, in Fairfax, in Geneva, and in Washington uh, without the support of members like you. Uh, if you're not members, we'd uh, like for you to join us if you're uh, so inclined, and uh, Dick or Larry and I uh, can talk to you about that. If you have any questions or reservations, we can be awfully persuasive. Thank you for your time.